Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, we're, tonight we're going to continue with our study of the book of John. Uh, we're going to pick up in chapter 4, verse 15. Uh, however, if you have not seen the previous studies, uh, starting with chapter 1, verse 1, we've worked our way up to this point, that please go back and watch those. I think it's particularly this book. The book of John is, to me, the, the most important book in the whole Bible. So I hope you will watch this study from the beginning. But uh, we'll, we'll pick up where we left off. And first, let me ask uh, Brother Eric to say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. It's me again. The homo. Okay. Back to you. All right. That's Brother Eric's YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it. Uh, okay. I'll, I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read it in the KJV first, and then after that, we'll look at it in the, um, uh, the Amplified. Uh, verse 15. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Uh, of course, we're at the, the Samaritan woman at the well. That's the point in the scriptures we're at right now. And, uh, and then Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in, in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Well, let me stop there here and uh, get your reaction to those verses. Uh... I really like this part of uh, the chapter where there it's leading into the discussion on worship and the type of worship that God wants from us. I could go into that. Well, I'll, I'll hold off for a minute. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, this, this, um, revelation that he gives the woman uh you know uh, we know that jesus is fully god and fully man but we also know that jesus set aside some of his powers as god um temporarily uh and, and so uh, i i'm not sure that he's um uh, he's omniscient at this point where he he seemed like uh, there I can't remember the exact verse maybe you can recall where it is this talks about how he set aside his uh, his power but um, he is able to uh, say things that kind of blows people's minds like this woman was immediately recognized him as a prophet because he knew things about her that he shouldn't have known and so she recognized you must be a prophet uh, this reminds me of also, was it Nathaniel or Philip that was under the uh, uh, the tree? Or was it the, the fig tree? Uh, or was uh, it, it was uh, Nathaniel tree? under the fig tree? Yeah. Is it a fig tree or an olive tree? I don't remember. But uh, he, um, I think it was an olive tree. Uh, because an olive tree. tree. What's that? It was the fig tree. Fig tree? Okay. Uh, but... Um, uh, was it, it was Nath Philip, you said? It was Nathaniel. Oh, Nathaniel, okay. But Nathaniel's response to Jesus was, you're the son of God. <laughs> you're the Christ. 
I mean, it was amazing how he, he would sell them something that, that he shouldn't have known. And then that, they're so impressed that they, he, she, he gets recognized as a prophet. He get recognized as the son of God, the Christ. And, um, uh, and yet he says, well, if you're impressed with that, oh man, imagine how you're impressed you're going to be when I show you all these other things I'm going to do. But all right. Um, let me read those verses in the Amplified here. We're starting. Where did he learn the doctrine? What? Where did he learn the doctrine of the coming of the Son of God? Did all Jews expect the coming Christ to be the Son of God? Well, yeah, it says in the Scriptures. Uh, yeah, you remember when... Uh, when, when Jesus was resurrected and he first started appearing to people, he appeared to two people walking down the road to Emmaus and he disguised himself so they couldn't recognize him at first. Uh, I think he was like a, a shapeshifter. He could change his appearance because uh, uh, he's talking to him and then, and then suddenly they, they, they are able to recognize him at a certain point. But what he's telling them all on the road to Emmaus, he says he went through the scriptures point by point, pointing out all the scriptures that we're talking about the, uh, about him. And uh, there's that that's where they get it. They they knew that this there there was a son of God. There was a Christ, a son of God. All these terminologies are used, and uh, everything that he did, uh, that he would be born of a virgin, that he'd be born in Bethlehem. Uh, that he would perform miracles, heal the, the, the sick, uh, the lame, the blind, the, the dumb, uh, raise from the dead. All these things were uh, in the Old Testament prophecies about what the Messiah would do, that he would be uh, pierced, uh, he, he, he would be crucified. They didn't use the word crucify in Isaiah 53. Uh, and and, and, in, and uh, uh, let me see, it's... Uh, Psalm 2022, those go into graphic details explaining this, his, his uh, crucifixion. Uh, but even though the word, the word crucifixion wasn't even invented because crucifixions didn't even begin for like 700 years or later. Uh, but that's all described. All of the, these things that, that the Messiah would do uh, are all in the Old Testament. So that's where we get it from. I was wondering, though, Brother Luke, I was wondering what the Judaica at that time was expecting the Christ to be. Did they expect the Christ to be the Son of God? Uh, well, I think it depends on each individual if they were how well they understood the scriptures and how, how well they studied. And not everybody was equal in terms of how how much they studied, how much they knew, and how much they understood. So uh, I, I we can't just say make a blanket statement that they everybody all Jews knew about that. Um, but, I would probably have to uh, reference my Jewish rabbi for that answer, wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. don't look at me like that. I'm kidding. All these. No, I was thinking. I was trying to think about where I left off before what I was saying before your last point. Uh, sometimes you say something and it's it's like you know it's a curveball and I I get all distracted and where I don't know what remember where I was. But yeah, all these things uh, were predicted that uh, describing what the Messiah would be like, that uh, he would be called Emmanuel, uh, which is, which means God with us. Uh, so these things are in the, in the scriptures and those people who studied knew the scriptures would be aware of these things. Uh, and that's why, remember the very first one, uh, Peter called him the son of God, the Christ, uh, right after he first met him, uh, uh, in, in the very first chapter, right after uh, John the Baptist pointing him out, Peter, Nathaniel, I think it was Philip. There were three people, John the Baptist. They all identified him as the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. You know, all those terms were used right away. So they had to be aware of 
that's his title and that's a description of who he is i was wondering now uh when the high priest was questioning jesus did he use the phrase son of god when he was questioning jesus i seem to recall that he may have what do you think uh yeah i, I believe i believe he did he accused him of blasphemy and tore his his vest uh is a sign that he had insulted god because he claimed that he's claiming that he is god uh, I, I forgot the exact uh way that uh caiaphas expressed it but i i uh, I, I think that is the right terminology. Um, let me read this in the Amplified. Uh, it says, um, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will get, not get thirsty nor have to continually come all the way here to draw. At this, Jesus said, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered, I do not have a husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I do not have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and the man you are now living with is not your husband. You have said this truthfully. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place where one ought to worship is in Jerusalem at the temple. Um, okay, uh, so we'll pick up with verse 21 in the in the KJV now. Um but the thing that we, I, if I remember what we were talking about last time when we, we uh, were finishing up, uh, it, it's astonishing that the Samaritan woman could, didn't understand the language that he was using, talking about living water, never thirsting again. Uh, she took it literally because she was in, uh, uh, in the flesh. She wasn't in the spirit. She wasn't thinking in terms of understanding him spiritually. Same thing with Nicodemus when, when he was being, discussing being born again. And Nicodemus says, well, how can I go back into my mother's womb again? And Jesus had to say, you know, this is spiritual talk, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's, it is interesting how these people, uh, they don't have any spiritual discernment. Um, now, let me go on. So, uh, yeah, their reactions to spiritual things were rather abnormal from today's perspective, and that leads me to think well, today we do have the Holy Spirit in the world, and what if when the Holy Spirit is removed, mankind returns to that state of thinking? What do you think? your your premise that the whole when the whole you say quote when the holy spirit is removed unquote uh, that's the kind of statement i would have made a few years ago uh, I, I did believe in dispensationalism in uh, futurism pre-tribulation rapture thought literal thousand year millennium all those things that you you probably still believe in uh, that's why you're saying that because you're expecting that the church will be taken away and the Holy Spirit will be taken off of the earth because the Holy Spirit lives in the believers. But uh, I, I don't I don't hold to that theology any longer. I, I, I believe that the resurrection, the rapture is one event at the end of time. And uh, so that, that I don't see any reason what to think that the Holy Spirit's going to be taken away. But that's something that you'd have uh, to look at. I meant the restrainer. I'm sorry. I meant the restrainer when the restrainer is removed. Oh, yeah. Well, a lot of people think that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. Uh, but uh, if it's not the Holy Spirit, what, what is the restrainer? Um, uh, I forgot. I, I, I've, I, I've studied eschatology, which is, if you're watching this and you don't understand all the terminology, eschatology is, means the, the study of the end times. And there's a, a, a number of different viewpoints and interpretations of, of what the Bible has to say about the final times, how history is going to play out. And uh, I've studied all the different viewpoints. And, uh, but I, my, my, uh, 
my focus in my, um, let's say my specialty is in soteriology, not eschatology. Soteri soteriology is the, the study of salvation. What, what, how do we see salvation? And so that's what I really focus on and, and try to be an expert on because that's what's most important. I want to, if you're watching this now, I want to tell you what you need to know so you get to go to heaven. Now, understanding how history is going to play out is interesting and I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it, but it's not nearly as important to understand that as it is how to get to heaven. So uh, your, your term there about the restrainer, uh, I don't know. I've read so many different things now. I'm a little bit confused. I can't recall exactly, you know, the various viewpoints on what the restrainer is. That's okay. I love how you turn that fuss around and headed it back in the right direction. Okay, keep driving. <laughs> okay, thank you, brother. Let me go now to the um, back to the KJV verse 21. Um, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me. The hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Okay, I think that's a good place to, to start, to stop. Just those two verses there. And let me see if I, what your response is to that. Uh, what really stood out to me was Jesus saying salvation is of the Jews? Uh, we could talk about that if you'd like. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. That that was the uh, really um, the key point that was made there. First, he's saying, um, "Ye worship, ye know not what." In other words, you Samaritans, you have no clue. I mean, even though they're half, you know, a Samaritan is a person that has a, uh, you know, let's say a, a Jewish father and a Gentile mother, for example. They're they're mixed. They're not full Jew, and uh, and and I imagine that the the Samaritans believed in either all or m much of Judaism. Uh, it probably, I don't, I've never really studied the Samaritan theology to to know what differences there are, if any. But Jesus is pointing out here that they don't really understand. Uh, he says, we know what we worship. You don't even know what you're worshiping. For salvation is of the Jews. Uh, I think the word of could be from. Uh, for salvation is from the Jews. Uh, because the Messiah, the Savior, comes from the Jews. Uh, and that's what, uh, it seems that, because the Savior comes from the Jews, the Jews should know what they worship. But as we know, as we pointed out already, the Jews, not all of them understand that. You were asking earlier about what they thought about the Messiah. You know, what, did they know he was the son of God and all that? Well, one thing that they didn't understand was that his, he was coming to set up a spiritual kingdom. They thought he was coming to set up a literal, physical kingdom. They thought he'd come and he'd be the leader of the army and they'd defeat the Romans and they can, he'd be the king of the country, like David was. Uh, and that's what they, that's how they thought it would be. And he had to correct and said, no, uh, the, the kingdom is not either here nor there. You can't, you can't say the kingdom's here or there. It's a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom is within us. It's a spiritual kingdom. And he said, this, the, the kingdom is now. He set up the kingdom of God right when he came. When he came, that's when he set it up. And every person who believes in him for their salvation uh, has the Holy Spirit in it. And they're in the spiritual kingdom of God at that moment. So they, the Jews really didn't really understand. that. See, they also didn't understand that he was coming for the, for the Jew first, but the Gentile would be also be included. So they didn't know that he was coming for the whole, say, the whole world. And they didn't know that Judaism would be discarded. It was a temporary thing. And after he saves us, there's no reason for Judaism anymore because uh, he's, he's already performed the, the final blood sacrifice. So they really, I think those are the three things that they didn't get. He wasn't going to be a physical king. It was a spiritual kingdom. 
the, the Gentiles will be included, and and uh, Judaism has to be discarded now. Now it's it's entirely based upon just trusting Jesus as your Savior. Uh, before I go on, what do you say about that? Uh, would you say that Judaism died and was buried and rose again as Christianity? I, I think that's a... Uh, that, that is an interesting way of expressing it, and, and I, I, I would say that um, it, is, it is true that Jesus practiced Judaism. He did it perfectly. Nobody else could do it. So he, he did it perfectly, but he proved that, hey, for everybody else, it's impossible. I'm the only one that can do it. <laughs> uh, uh, but... But then when he died, you're right, Judaism, not only it, it didn't really die technically at this point of his death, burial and resurrection, the, 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 the need for it died with him. Uh, and, and, and then with his resurrection, you know, the, the, uh, the, the new faith, the new uh, belief system, believing that we need, rather than getting saved by practicing our religion, and, and, but well, the Jews never really were taught that in the Old Testament. They didn't. They thought they practiced their religion in order to get blessings from God and to to be able to get to the Promised Land. Never in the Old Testament does it say that if you practice the Judaism perfectly, if you really follow all the commandments, that that's how you get to heaven. That's not what it says in the Old Testament. Uh, but there's a lot of confusion over that, and. Uh, uh, so did Judaism die? I think Judaism actually did die at the destruction of the temple. That's when it really died. It, it was of no use at all. The only purpose it really served was an atonement, a temporary covering as symbolic of the fact that the propitiation would come, that Jesus would come and pay for our sins, and it would be, it would be a perfect payment. Uh, so that the purpose of the... Uh, animal sacrifices and the practicing of Judaism, uh, that th there was no need to do it anymore after Jesus' uh, death, burial, and resurrection. But the unbelieving Jews, the ones who didn't put their faith in Jesus, actually, even, even the believing Jews, uh, the first believing Jews, they, as you know from studying that uh, church history, uh, they, they thought that, you know, you had to keep getting circumcised and follow the law of Moses, and they argued over that. And finally, Finally, um, uh, you know, the, the truth won out and, and true Christianity was, hey, it's faith alone in Christ alone. Judaism is not part of this anymore. Uh, but the, the Jews who never put their faith in Jesus and they continued practicing Judaism, well, in 70 AD, when Titus conquered Jerusalem and destroyed Jerusalem, the temple and everything, they could no longer practice Judaism because an integral part of practicing Judaism is temple worship and, and animal sacrifices. They haven't done it since 70 AD. No Jew has really practiced Judaism since 70 AD. So it did die. You want to turn this bus around? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me read that in the Amplified now, just those two verses here. See how it expresses it. Um. Jesus replied, woman, believe me, a time is coming when God's kingdom comes, when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans do not know what you worship. We Jews do know what we worship, for salvation is from the Jews. All right, so that fills in a couple of blanks there. Um, let me read it in the, ampl in the KJV now, starting with verse 23. But the hour cometh... And now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, let me stop there, verse 24. 
Uh, you probably have something to say about that. Uh, that's the new birth, isn't it? Now, you've got spirit and truth. Spirit, the Holy Spirit, truth, is the word of God. Jesus. <coughs> now, those two combine and create new life inside of us. Okay, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Worship it. God is spirit, first of all. Uh, that's what it says. It not only says it there, but in the Old Testament, it says God is spirit. Uh, and, you know, God is able to do a uh, anthropomorphic transformation whenever he wants to. In other words, that's a theophany or a Christophany. That's where God appears to men as a person. He, he did it in the garden when he walked with Adam and Eve. Um, he did it with Abraham when he talked to Abraham and they were negotiating over uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he, he, he's done it numerous times he, when he wrestled with Jacob. Uh, and so throughout the history of the world, God has... Um, done these theophies, he's appeared as a man to serve a purpose temporarily. But the truth is God is remains a spirit. And then the word, God, God said, I, I need to save mankind. So I will send, it says, God so loved the world to get it, sent his only begotten son. So God sent the word, which it says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. So God sent the word and it, the word became flesh and lived among us and, and, and manifest in the flesh as the son of God, Jesus Christ. So uh, God is spirit, but he can take on flesh whenever he wants in order to serve his purpose. And worshiping him in spirit and in truth, I think uh, the, the worship in him in spirit is through our born again, regenerated spirit and the spirit, the Holy Spirit being united with God. That's how we worship him in spirit. And, and in truth means that Jesus is the truth. You can't worship God without worshiping in Jesus. He is our savior God. So I, I think you connected the dots correctly there. Well, you nailed it there, Brother Luke. Uh, this is a sticking point because people need to know about this. It's very important. There's a lot of uh, false religion out there that think they can get the Holy Spirit without uh, receiving the truth first. And that's just not so. Okay. All right. Okay, let me see. Uh... I'll read that in the Amplified, 20, verse 23 and 24. It says, um, But a time is coming and is already here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit from the heart and the inner self and in truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. Uh, God is spirit, the source of life, yet invisible to mankind. And yet those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. All right, I'll go to the KJV now for the next verse. Verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Oh, man. Wow. I mean, there's no, there's no uh, uh, symbolism, riddles. Uh, you must be born again. Uh, drink the living water. I mean, there's nothing to, to be interpreted or misunderstood. It's as direct and as, as concise as can possibly be. I am the Messiah, the Christ. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, it didn't record her reaction. Uh, next time we hear about her, uh, where we know she believed him, uh, and she went and brought her friends uh, in the future reference here. Okay. Well, I, I think we do see her reaction as we go on. Not, not an immediate reaction, but we do see the outcome of it. Uh, uh, let me read that in the Amplified, though. Um, verse 25 and 26. The woman saith to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, the anointed. When that one comes, he will tell us everything we need to know. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he, the Messiah. Okay, verse 27 in the KJV says, and upon this came his disciples. They just interrupted him just at the, just at the worst possible time to interrupt him, right when he's going for the, to, to, to you know, uh, uh, we're waiting for her response and she doesn't, she doesn't that's, you know, have you ever had anybody interrupt you just at the wrong time? You're witnessing to somebody and then somebody else has to say something just at the wrong time. They're kind of like stepping on your words. Well, it looks like to me that Jesus wrapped it up nice and neatly and uh, she got the message and she believed and entered the disciples. It all went smoothly and perfectly in my IMHO. Yeah, that's true. I would have liked to see what, uh, if they hadn't come, how she would have responded to him then and the rest of the conversation. But it says, um, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? Uh, why are they amazed that he's talking to a, a woman? Uh, see, that's why I wasn't sure if I could have a woman lawyer, because of that verse. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Jewish people not only uh, ha had a certain status for women that was uh, not equal to, to the man in some ways, uh, but also just non-Jews, the, the, all non-Jews, which are called Gentiles, they, they wouldn't even associate with them. And first of all, not only is Jesus talking to a woman, he's talking to a Samaritan woman. Samaritan. I mean, that's even worse than a regular Gentile because they're half Jew and half Gentile. So they're thinking, why in the world is is our Lord talking to this woman Samaritan? Uh, but uh, we know that uh, you you can have this woman for your lawyer or your your spiritual advisor if, uh, if that's what you mean uh, today. If, if uh, uh, because Paul clarified it that now things are different. Uh, we're all one in Christ. There is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. There's no difference between male and female. We're all equal in terms of we're a, a child of God. That's so, great. I'll take a hundred of them. <laughs> okay. Um, the... The woman then left her water pot. <laughs> I, don't know. I, I can see why she wanted to leave right away. They certainly told her, uh, you know, it's pretty insulting to say, well, wow, man, why are you talking with this woman? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come, see a man which told me all things I ever did. It, is not this the Christ? So she's either believing or on the on the fence about believing uh, his claim. Uh, then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore saith the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Okay. I bet you have something to say about that. 
Yeah, I guess you remembered when I said uh, I don't have to eat. Did I tell you that one time? Yeah. I told Tonto that one time too. But I had to explain it more clearly to Tonto. Uh, I had to tell him, well, we still need to eat, but uh, God could preserve you without eating if he wanted to. Yeah. Uh, okay. Back to you. Well, we also know that uh, the Bible tells us that man does not live by bread alone, which is food. Man does not live by food alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so uh, uh, there are some, sometimes our physical needs that can be set aside temporarily. You know, you know, he, he, he probably wasn't even not even feeling any hunger because he's absorbed in what he's doing, even though he had a real body and it had real needs like hunger, fatigue, thirst you know all these things really did affect his his human humanity uh, and yet uh, even you and i if we're totally absorbed in something our hunger is we, we forget about it for a while because we're we're involved in something and and that's if we're involved in ministry then uh uh you know that's the spiritual food whether we're eating by drinking in the word reading the word having fellowship or ministering teaching other people uh that's that's the word of god that's uh, that's spiritual food i'll read it in the amplified uh let me see um meanwhile the disciples were urging jesus to have a meal saying rabbi teacher eat but he told them uh i oh i forgot i, I was up for uh uh verse 28 the, the, then the woman left her water jar and went into the city and began telling the people come see a man who told me all the things that i've ever done uh, can this be the christ the messiah the anointed so the people left the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus to have a meal, saying, Rabbi, teacher, eat. But he told them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me to completely finish his work. Wow. Isn't it weird that before the cross, everybody was just so literally minded? Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, that is a very, very good point. Uh, I, I, I just really started recognizing those. I mean, you, you notice that all those years you, you read uh, about Nicodemus, you know, I, we probably all thought, come on, he, he's such a wise man, you know, so knowledgeable and studied so much and respected and 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 yet he's uh he's thinking jesus is really telling him he has to go back into his mother's womb i mean is, is he dense there or something uh but uh we're seeing that so many times people are not they're not in the spirit they are not seeing it through spiritual eyes and uh that, that's why some of these things don't make sense but uh, i i think now um now that we have the all the new testament for us and we study it uh we should be able and we have the holy spirit uh we we should be able to have this spiritual discernment okay uh let me read continue in the kjv um verse 35 Say not ye that there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields. They are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eter life eternal, that, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. 
And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Okay, that's verse 38. I'll stop there for now. Um, all right, what does that mean to you, brother? Uh, looks to me like the, the reapers make more money than the sowers. Is that what Jesus is saying? Okay. Well, it's, it's kind of like that, uh, the way you phrased it, kind of like that parable about the workers in the vineyard. Do you remember how that one went? What? Yeah, but I remember that one, everybody got paid the same. Yeah, yeah, they got paid the same. So in other words, um, if you started working at the beginning of the day and you worked 14 hours, or if I start at the end of the day and only worked one hour, he paid everybody the same it's the kind of the same kind of thing it seems like well that's not fair but guess what it's not fair that anybody gets saved it's all by grace it's not based on fairness it's based on what god's graciousness that's a good lesson right there yeah yeah everybody needs to hear that lesson all right i'll read that in the amplified here uh let me see Verse 35, th th first, uh, uh, 35. Do you, do you not say, it is still four months until the harvest comes? Look, I say to you, raise your eyes and look at the fields and see. They are white for harvest. Already the reaper is receiving his wages and, and he is gathering fruit for eternal life so that he who plants and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One person sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap a crop for which you have not worked. Others have worked and you have been privileged to reap the results of their work. I, I'm, I wish I knew who he's talking about in this particular case when he's saying, look to his his apostles his, his disciples he doesn't have apostles yet at this point does he just disciples um but he uh says uh he says you're going to be reaping for uh, but from what other people worked. other people did this work prior to you and you get to reap all the benefits from it uh but what other people is he talking about the prophets uh I was thinking that was the first thing I thought of. And then my second thought might have been John the Baptist ministry. And uh, there's a mystery there that could be looked into. Uh, but I don't think I know very much about it personally. Why wasn't he more specific? <laughs> All right, let me go back to KJV, verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. You see? Look at that. They're saying the Savior of the world. These Samaritans understood this more than the, the, than the, the Jews. They kept thinking he's only there for the Jews. They're saying he's the Savior of the world. John the Baptist understood it. He said, behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the, of the world, whole world. But most of the regular Jewish people, they didn't get it. They thought that uh, the Messiah was coming only for the Gentile, I mean, only for the Jews. That's pretty amazing. That's, that's wonderful 
statement declaration i think it's great how she went and it says in that verse uh many believe because she uh went and testified of him so she got born again and she went and brought others and told them and they uh, uh, many people got born again because because of her testimony do you think at that point they got born again or maybe they didn't get born again just yet what what's your thoughts on that well i i think that they uh, they believed and so they're saved but they just don't have the holy spirit yet because they had the faith it's just like when he's talking about he talks about uh, a woman her faith your faith has saved you so God uh, likes credit. God is a God of credit. Yeah. Well, just look, look at the, the Old Testament saints. Look, look, what about Noah? You know, what about Moses? Abraham. They all got saved on credit. Yeah, and that they credit all, was... They all got saved because, resurrection. because of their faith in God providing their salvation. They didn't know he was named, named Jesus. They didn't know about a cross necessarily. And they did know Isaiah and David's description of being pierced. And they didn't know how God was going to save them like that blind man that Jesus healed. He didn't know how Jesus healed him either. Yeah. Uh, but all he knew is he was once blind and now he could see. Yeah. So they, they talk about dispensations and, and, and saying that... Uh, a dispensation is a way that God is dealing with man throughout history, and he deals with them differently during different dispensations. But the truth is that there's, there's no uh, different way of dealing with them. And it's always been God's, well, if you'll just trust me, I'll, I'll take care of you. I'll handle it all. Just trust me. Uh, and, but he told, they learned more and more about who he was and what he was going to do and how he would go about doing it. And that there, eventually that there would be the son of God who died, die for the sins of the world. And at this point, these Samaritans understood that this savior, this, this um, Christ was coming to be the savior of the world. So they knew a lot, but you and I know more than they knew. Because we have hindsight and we have the scriptures to look and we're looking back it's a lot easier to have hindsight and look back and see things clearly instead of people seeing shadows and pictures of the cross and not understanding of that moses standing there with his arms up to, to so they can prevail in the battle and someone on each side of him holding his arms up that's a picture of jesus on the cross and the the two uh, thieves on each side. See, they they didn't they didn't understand all these pictures that we can look and we can say, oh, it's a picture of Christ and the res his death, burial, and resurrection and our salvation. There's there's dozens and dozens of pictures, but it was just it was veiled. They couldn't really, they didn't understand everything perfectly. But what all they needed to really understand at that point was that God was going to provide salvation for them if they'll trust Him. Well, I don't know why uh, people can't see it. I see it everywhere. I see it in my breakfast. I see it in the days. I see it in the seasons. I see it in the animals. I see it in our life cycles. It's everywhere. Yeah. Well, how did, how did, was it Paul that phrased it? That, you know, there, no one has an excuse because God's revealed himself through his creation. All right, let me... We're running out of time, but let me see how many more verses we have here. Uh, verse 43. I guess I better stop here. Verse. Uh, no, let me try another one. Verse 43. Now, after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. <laughs> oh gosh i've used that verse myself numerous times can i ask let me ask you um the statement jesus testified a prophet hath no honor in his own country how do you think i possibly applied that to my life and maybe you have too oh you're gone okay <laughs> Uh, I can't have you answer if you're not there. 
All right. Uh, let me see. I'll go on reading then. Then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was, has, was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went up to, unto him and besought that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. All right, brother. You probably, did you hear anything I just said or just? Well, I had to go let the dogs out. I missed a little bit of it, but I think I got the important parts. Okay. All right, well, let me back up to a verse and just get your reaction to this one verse here. Um, uh, it says, uh, verse 44, Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. And I was making a point that, are you gone again? You're still there. Oh, okay, I thought you left again. Uh, I was making the point that that verse, uh, I've, offered, I've applied that numerous times in my life. And, and, and can you think of any way I could apply that verse in my life? A prophet is with, not without honor except in his own country. That means if you want to apply that, then you would have to like go to Mexico or something. <laughs> Uh, but I saw something in those verses uh, that uh, got my attention uh, more than so than this verse. All right, go ahead. What? Well, uh, the verse where it says the woman believed Jesus' words. You know, uh, we've been sorely denounced by a certain sex for merely believing in Jesus' words words that give life and salvation like john three sixteen. some people say well you can't believe that and they've demonized us for believing that and it really breaks my heart why would somebody be so cruel we know that uh uh, the man believed Jesus when Jesus said, go, your son is healed. Uh, he, he left. He believed him. And when we get to the next few verses, we'll see that uh, he did get healed. Um, I will just say this this verse about a prophet is not respecting his his own country. Uh, it's Let me see how it's phrased in the Amplified. I'm curious. Uh, what verse is it? Verse 44 here. Uh, it says, uh, For Jesus himself declared that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Uh, it's it's kind of like almost even in his own family. Uh, and, and, and I can say that in my own family. I've had p members of my family that I witnessed to. Uh, and, and thankfully, I, I believe they're all, all believers now. Well, not all, but all, many of them are believers now. Uh, but in the beginning, they didn't respect it coming from me because I said, well, who are you? I mean, I've known you my whole life, and why should I listen to you? You're, what do you know that I don't know? You know, 
because I'm so they, they know me so well, I'm so familiar with them that there's no respect for what I have to, what I'm telling them about the Bible. And so in some cases I found, well, I guess it's just uh, has to come from someone else and someone else can witness to them and they'll maybe be willing to listen. But when sometimes you're so close to someone, they'll say, oh, come on, I remember you. Look, you know, you're, uh, I, I know you too well to, to, uh, to um, respect what you're telling me because I, you know, look, look who you're talking about. I, I know who you are. You know, can you, you understand what I'm saying about this? Uh, I see what you're saying, Brother Luke. Uh, but I'm not going to give up on my family. And, uh, I don't want nobody giving up on none of their family. Yeah, well, I don't either. But uh, I'm just saying that that's the reason. Sometimes when you witness to your own family, it's it's less effective than when, when someone else witnesses them because you're the you know they they can they'll hear it from somebody else, but but they're not going to hear it from you. You know, that's, that's just the way it is. And even in Jesus' own family, you know, we know that um, uh, his, his own family didn't, uh, didn't believe in who he was. I'm, I, I'm assuming that Mary knew because she had to deal with uh, Gabriel at the Immaculate Conception. And she, I'm sure she must have known exactly who he was. But, but I think the rest of his family, some of them, they were skeptical. And uh, they, they thought he'd lost his mind. Even when they went, tried to encounter him and bring him out, um, and, and uh, because he was stirring up so much trouble, they were worried for him. They thought he's lost his mind, and and then he says, yeah, "They said your your mother and your brothers are out here. They want to talk to you." And he said, "Whoever listens to me is my mother and my brother." All right, brother. Uh, it's time to end the broadcast. Uh, what sum up your thoughts on the study tonight? Well, uh, it was a very interesting study. Uh, there's just not enough time. Uh, this is the, this is what we've been waiting to study for so long, and we're in it now. We're in the midst of it, and and we still ain't got enough time to do it. Okay, back to you. Well, we got enough time. We just have to take a 23-hour break. Um. All right, now let me close the broadcast with telling you all the good news uh, about the free gift of salvation. Um, it, you know, you could study the whole Bible and uh, learn a lot of things from it, but if, if you don't learn the one thing that is uh, that, that is of utmost importance, then it, it basically would be a waste of time. And the one thing you really need to learn from the Bible is what do you have to do so you can go to heaven after you die? Um, if I was to ask that question to, you know, you right now, if, if we asked everybody in America, all people around the world, almost everybody would say, what do I have to do to go to heaven? Well, let me see. I, I got to be a good person. Um, I got to be religious. Uh, I, I got, uh, you know, uh, give to charities. I, I've got to stop sinning. They, the whole world's philosophy today and throughout all of history has always been the philosophy of personal merit. People think that when they die, that uh, uh, if, if they if they've lived a good life, they've been a good person, they'll end up in heaven, and if they've been good enough, and if they haven't been good enough, they don't qualify for heaven. They'll go to hell. That's what most of the people, well, all the religions of the world pretty much believe the same thing, that salvation is based upon personal merit. Um, but if, if that's what you believe, I want you to know that that is not God's way. That's man's philosophy. It says this in, in Romans 10, verse 3. It says, if you're trying to establish your own righteousness as a means of getting salvation, it's not going to work. That's man's way, but God's way is different. God's way is trusting the Savior, receiving the righteousness of Jesus Christ instead of relying on your own. So and the, new, the, the good news is that this salvation uh, is offered to you right now, to everyone, to whosoever, to any person without exception. It's offered to all of you right now 
with no strings attached, simply as a free gift from Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to uh, be religious to earn it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to make donations and try to buy your way into heaven. It's impossible to do that anyway, because Jesus already did all the work to get it for you. He lived a perfect sinless life and he suffered and died on a cross to pay for our, our sins. He paid for salvation with his blood and death and suffering. He bought it, he paid it, and he's offering it to you as a free gift. That's what the Bible says. That's what I call biblical Christianity. But if you go to most churches in America and you know, all the Roman Catholic churches around the world, you're not going to hear that. You're going to hear the merit system. If you want to go to heaven, you got to do the best you can and then keep your fingers crossed, hoping it's good enough. Well, if you want to try that, go ahead and try. Try to get there on your own merit and uh, you're going to find out in the end you'll be sadly disappointed because Jesus says it's impossible. The Bible says that the standard is perfection and all people fall short of that. We can never reach that level. So what I'm asking you to do is reject that philosophy. Say, I, I admit it, it is impossible. I could never be perfect. It's already too late. I've, I've already been flawed. I've already made mistakes. I've already sinned. But the good news is Jesus paid for our sins. Now we get to go to heaven because of what he did. So long as you put your faith in him, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus made a audacious claim. He said he's the only way to get into heaven. What are you going to do with that claim? Will you believe him and receive his gift of eternal life? Or you will say, oh, I don't believe Jesus' claim. I, I think there's another way. I'll, I'll try to get there on my own. What will you do with Jesus Christ? What will you do with this free gift of salvation? So put your faith in him. I want you to know who he is. Uh, the Bible says that he's God Almighty. He came down from heaven. He was manifest in the flesh. He lived, he dwelled among us as a man named Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He died on a cross. He paid for all of our sins. And then he raised himself from the dead as a sign to prove he is God. He, he is our Savior, and he does have the power to give us life everlasting. So put your faith in Jesus now, and then make a comment. Let us know what, that you did it. If you do put your faith in Jesus now, you are eternally secure. You don't ever have to worry about losing your salvation because he says, I, I will never leave you or forsake you. I have you in the palm of my hand, and no one can pluck you out. So once you put your faith in Jesus, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven no matter what. And finally, Brother Eric, what, what do you have to say? Brother Luke, since God put so much into our salvation, I think it would only be fair that we thank him for that great salvation, sort of getting off to a good right start. So let's just... uh pray this prayer dear Jesus thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and being buried and rising again the third day to give me eternal life in paradise with you forever we happily receive this gift Lord in Jesus name amen okay and if you're wondering what the Lord wants you to do now he wants you to go and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, back to you. All right. Thank you, brother. Beautifully stated. Um, so if you see my logo here, this illustrates that Jesus is reaching out to you. He wants to grab a hold of you and pull you up to heaven, giving you eternal life. Will you accept it? I hope you do. All right. Uh, thank you for watching and join us nightly at 7 p.m. Pacific time.